Hey, uh, we are live. Uh, we're recording. I'm with Loretta. Loretta, uh, how are you today? <laughs> hey, I'm I'm sitting in a quarantine hotel in Sydney, um, <laughs> stuck with no air. <laughs> I haven't. Okay. Had, I will never take fresh air for granted ever again in my life. Why is that? Why your your hotel room doesn't have a, a balcony? Doesn't have a window. Doesn't have a what? what uh huh? Oh no, that sounds uh, not so fun. It's not. not. So fun. How and how long have you been in there for? Uh, now eleven days. Oh, 11 days. Okay, okay. Yeah, I've and got what? I've got three more days. Three more, and then you're back home. Oh, well, then I get to see my daughter, who I haven't seen for a year. So I'm super excited. Oh my god, that must be yeah. That must be a, yeah. You must be super pumped about that. Um, yeah. How is uh? So okay, so I usually start with where did we first meet? Um, I'm oh trying wow. To remember, uh, where did you and I first meet? Okay, so um, hmm, I don't even remember. Was I, it oh, in I India? Think I do, I think or was I do, it I think in Canada? No, 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 no. I think I remember. And correct me if, or tell me if there's like a time maybe before this, but um, I think it was at Perry Ann's event. Or could it, is that right? Ah, could yeah, that have no, been what, right? Oh, that's probably you about know Perry Ann's event. No, I don't know. Isn't that? Yeah, yeah. No, you know, I was thinking that was in DC in 2017. Yeah, probably around there. Yeah, but I think maybe it was um was it before that or after? I can't remember. In DC or something like that, I think. Yeah. No, Two, anyways. 2000, 2007, 2017 is quite the blur to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and your your and so and so as I was mentioning to you earlier is, is like one of the things they're trying to do is uh, I'm, I'm doing this podcast and 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 one of the goals is to capture people's kind of like their stories really uh people who have done you know as i think that have done really great things in the bitcoin space that are doing great things in the bitcoin space to capture a bit of kind of really their lens uh before and look some people start with their first job some people start with uh when their parents met uh you know you can take it back as far back as you want but really um the idea was kind of like what what was your lens uh before you know before you got into bitcoin and then really curious kind of how bitcoin you know changed that the arc of your you know i guess your view of the world and 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 you know all the other things that maybe you've done in the space after that but but we'd love to start with yeah kind of your story yeah so i um been 51 i've been around for quite a while so i started my life as a derivatives trader and i was laughing about this with someone the other day so i started in 1991 on the sydney futures exchange in the three-year bond pit with a piece of paper and a pencil so i got thrown this book they said all right you, you can be the option woman and i didn't know what an option was let alone what a future was um and i remember having this this page of numbers and somebody hit me on a on, on a futures option on a three-year bond and i had no clue what i'd done so i had to run downstairs and i spent 10 minutes in the toilet trying to figure out what a delta hedge was so then i ran back upstairs and then that was my first introduction to financial markets and then i spent the next 30 years of my life being a derivatives trader so I guess been a, 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 I'd be out trading every asset class that I've, tra I've traded equities, I've traded commodities, I've traded futures, I've traded um, bonds, fixed income, uh, you name it, I traded it. So when I discovered um, in 2015, a friend of mine was the Australian, head of the Australian regulator, ASIC, and Greg and I have been friends for a long time. He built the securitisation securitization markets around the world um, for SOCGEN, and he was, he yeah, in the in the 80s and 90s. So he said to me, we're on the bus together because we live close to each other. Um, he said to me, you've got to have a look at this thing called blockchain already because it's going to change the world. And I said, oh, really, Greg? And I spent the first weekend of my life thinking that blockchain was, was Minecraft. <laughs> and I spent a weekend on Minecraft with my nine-year-old daughter trying to figure out how the hell it was going to change the world. And I spoke to him the next week and I said, Greg, I'm not sure what you're talking about with this Minecraft business. And he said, what, what are you talking about? And I said, well, weren't you talking about Minecraft? He said, no, when did I mention Minecraft? So then he said, I'm talking about blockchain. So that was that was a lucky moment. And then I went and read the blockchain revolution. <laughs> yeah. Had I thought that Minecraft was going to put us where we were today, that might not have had a longevity to it. Um, so then I went and read the blockchain revolution, which you were in, Sunny, by Don Tapscott. And I was doing some consultancy work because I'd come back from India. I'd be I'd run I'd run um, a global bank in India. I was the managing director of RBS. I think I was the youngest female ever to be a managing director of a bank um, in India that wasn't even Indian by the age of 42. So I tried to retire, but I don't think that was ever going to happen because I'm not one that 
can stop for two seconds. So I was doing some consulting work for a stock exchange in Australia called the Sydney Stock Exchange. And when I read the blockchain revolution, it hit me that the problem that I'd had with asset classes my entire career and my life and what was the biggest problems um, for traders was, was um, T plus three. For an equity market, it's, it's trading plus settlement. The clearing settlement is just ridiculous in every different market around the world. So I looked at what blockchain could do and I thought, oh my God, we could really bring clearing settlement across asset classes to, to zero. So to just trading because you automatically swapped asset. So that was how I got into blockchain. And I didn't know nothing about Bitcoin. And then, um, so then I, I was approached, I helped the Australian Digital Chamber of Commerce, the equivalent in the US. Um, I became the advisory chair and my job was then to lobby government. And I remember going into the Australian government in Canberra and somebody was talking about crypto assets and somebody was talking about um, virtual assets and someone was talking about you know, cryptocurrencies. And I was like, well, what are you all talking about? And they went, we don't know. And I said, well, that's not a very good answer because if you don't know how the hell are the rest of us meant to know. So we, the Attorney General's office were quite intelligent because they come up with the term digital assets. Um, so then I traced back to the first ever Bitcoin transaction to one done in the US. And under a court of law in the US, it was considered to be a commodity. So I was like, all right, well, if it's a commodity, let's just all agree on that. And, um, and I think Bitcoin from what I could understand, was the first application of blockchain, but it was the first in what I now call a digital asset. So we, with blockchain, we can digitalize any asset class. And I think that's what excited me the most, not what Bitcoin itself was, but how we could now tokenize every asset class that we've ever had, make them efficient and fast and making clear and sell, settlement effectively redundant. So that's how I got into it. And then I tried to buy some Bitcoin and it was the most ridiculous process I've ever gone through. Like I'm going the, like, on a on a so-called exchange, and and I don't think cryptocurrency exchanges are exchanges because having worked and and having a number of advisory positions on security exchanges, they're very onerous with the word exchange. So you know you, they're public private partnerships, they're the infrastructure of a country. Um, a, a cryptocurrency exchange is nothing more than a, than an um, than a matching agent. So it's just where you have a marketplace effectively to swap because the exchange in cryptocurrency terms doesn't take any risk. Um, and in security exchanges, we have this one concept which no one ever remembers called novation. So in the time that an um, that a, an asset whether it be an equity or a derivative or whatever it is, is mm. swapped on a security exchange, there's that, that, moment, that instantaneous moment where the exchange takes the risk of the buyer and seller. So that's the very, that's the very different essence, I guess, of why crypto exchanges shouldn't be called exchanges. And when they started to call them exchanges, they, you know, people around the world got very confused. And then I, so I looked at Bitcoin and I thought, this, people really don't have too much idea what they're doing. They need a bit of self-regulation. So we we worked together with the Australian government and we came up with some self-regulation rules around Bitcoin. And I think that was the start for me where I thought this industry in its infancy needs a bit of tidying up. It needs to understand you know, if you're going to take, you'd be put into mainstream or you're going to be taken seriously by governments and, and regulators, then we need to start to fess up and start to act maturely so so then i started to do that and that and people seem to like our self-regulation in australia and then all these other jurisdictions started to adopt it and i started to talk about digital assets of which crypto um cryptocurrencies are just a subset so i was more focused on the fact that digital assets you know we could now digitalize any asset class and make um you know the liquidity functions in secondary markets faster than we've ever seen in history and now we have this new asset class digital assets so in 2017, I did actually buy Bitcoin by then, so I'm pretty glad that I did now. I wish I had bought more. I went off to Davos and I met the Premier of um, Bermuda and the rest of his history. He said to me, would you like to come to Bermuda and write our legislation around these around digital assets? And I said, I don't know where Bermuda is. And he said, well, it's in the Atlantic Ocean. And I said, well, I'm not going to go there. But he convinced me the next day I jumped on a plane and off I went. And three months later, we'd written the first legislation in the world around digital assets and ICOs, initial coin offerings. But the one thing, so that through, taught me, um, so I spent, I guess I spend my time working between the industry, people like you, Sunny, as you know, being quite the, you know, the evangelist and trying to translate what you tell me into the words that the regulators and governments understand. And I think over the years, I've learned one thing. If Bitcoin had have been called Zen token, no central bank 
no government, no policymaker would have been worried. But the minute we put coin into anything, we we upset we you know we upset the mandates of central bank governors. Um, ICOs, initial coin offerings, should have been called initial business offerings because they're di just digital crown funds. And we probably wouldn't, and yeah, as I said, crypto exchanges should have been called digital asset marketplaces. And we probably would have been a lot far advanced in where our dialogues are with regulators and governments had we have done that a number of years ago. But I think that's the, you know, that's the immaturity of, of the asset class. And, you know, people just wanted a bit of recognition to start to use these terms in 2000. And, no, um, so that's what I've done. I spent the yeah the years since then. The rest is history, and I work for a lot of governments, um, a lot of law enforcement agencies, a lot of central banks. Ask me now, um, it, it, exactly defining on what you do in the industry, and um, yeah, and how we can translate into the the terms and um, the space of what regulators, regulators and policymakers. Um, think about this industry around the world and make it let, sort of demystified, I guess, and make it not as scary as it seems. Okay, so there was a lot there. Um, okay, just a couple of maybe highlights, right? So, okay, first of all, you're you're from you're from Australia, right? <laughs> right? Are, are you originally are you originally from there? Yes. What yeah, city are you from? Just, just curious. What um, city? I've, I come from a little small mining, coal mining town about three hours west of Sydney where I grew up. Um, I went to boarding school when I was 12 years old in Sydney. I then went to university in Sydney. So I lived there for the majority of um, my early life, I guess. I left, when did I leave? I think I, I just I decided that Australia was going to be way too small for me when I was about 21. And I, I guess I haven't really lived um in Australia full time since since I was 21. So I've lived, lived in a number of places around the world, uh, including you know, India, where I lived for almost a decade. Um, for a decade, yeah. you, li you live in India for a decade. And then that and that was, and you, you kind of went through it quickly, but there was a bank called, uh, which bank was it that you worked with? Yeah, was so I went, I originally, I, 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 I have a little girl who's 16 and I'm a single mum. So I decided when she was about eight months old that it was costing me way too much money um, to have her put in daycare in Australia. I was, I was trading on derivatives desk and it meant it was starting like six in the morning and finishing at midnight. In those days, we didn't have mobile phones. We had landlines. Um, so, you know, the, the world of co continuous trading, even then, wasn't wasn't 24-7. We had breaks because we had people doing it. Um, so I went, any, many, money mo, where can I go that I can take my daughter to um, <laughs> yeah. that is not as expensive? And mm. Macquarie Bank, who's a bank in Australia, were advertising a job and they couldn't get anyone to fill it to run their derivatives desk in, in Mumbai, in India. Cool. So I said, all right, I'll go. So I took a job in Mumbai, India, without ever being there. Um, and I chuffed off with my eight-month-old eight child to work there well, which, which, and then when which I bank which out, bank was it with macquarie bank which is an australian investment bank interesting so, interesting and you just moved out there what year was that loretta that you moved out to 2000 india 2000 and it would have been 2005 towards and what was the nature what was the nature of your role there like what did what was so, what did so you day to, yeah i was doing just what i did in australia so running the derivatives desk i'm um, doing futures and it was interesting because i got to trade for a lot of my u.s clients anyway that were based um, out of the US, um, but they used me in India because it was a really good time zone. And so I, I did exactly what I did in Australia, but I did it in India and and started to trade Indian equity markets, which was which I'd never done before, which was quite the eye opener. Um, yeah, so, so India taught me a lot of things. It taught me, um, first is that you need a lot of patience in life, that no doesn't mean no, you just ask the question in a different way. And there is two sides to every story. So that's that's the, that's the mantra that I've I've continued on um, with myself since I lived in India because it was a large learning curve, but it was awesome. So I I, I lived there and then I ended up my last job was running um, RBS, so I was the managing director of the equity business. That was interesting, and that's when I decided when my little girl, um, how old was she then? She must have been. She wasn't that old. So she went back to Australia. She was speaking Hindi as her first language, not English. Um, and she's blonde and blue eyed. So I thought I better take her home so she can uh, have the, uh, the education that I had and grow up in the place that I called home. Mm, cool, cool. And uh, a couple other things there I was going to ask you about was that um, 
in terms of in, okay so wait, so about your your first exposure to because you talked about how your first exposure was kind of like blockchain yeah and i think you mentioned blockchain revolution it's funny you said that i actually hit up don today and he agreed oh. to coming on the show soon so or on this whatever episode uh this podcast um but but i'm just curious um wh- when was your when was your first kind of introduction to bitcoin uh like itself and when were you kind of like wait this is maybe more than just you know i don't know whatever i guess like the news portrays it as or whatever yeah so that was so i looked at blockchain in 2015 and then i said yeah i still didn't click to me and then when i as i told you i tried to buy some bitcoin and i couldn't figure out how to do that and i was like i'm not sure if these people understand you know kyc and aml and it was just a ridiculously arduous process um, so I remember when I, then I got my first Bitcoin and then I was trying to figure out what the hell it was. So I think that was when the years I started to meet you and everybody else in the industry because I thought, um, as being a female, females do two things. We ask directions and we, we always put our windscreen wipers on. So I, you know, I, will, I always take myself as being the most stupid person in the room. So then I think I met you and, and I think it was at Perry Ann's event when I'd been put on a panel with people that were talking about re- regulation of Bitcoin. And I remember we did a Mexican wave in the, in the auditorium at um, Georgetown University. And I remember afterwards, maybe it was you and, and Kyle Kemper and Joseph Weinberg, they came up to me and said, you're the coolest old lady we've ever seen because you just like, you, you made us do a Mexican way. So I think that was my introduction to everyone in, the, in you guys in the ecosystem. And so then I spent you know, the next three years trying to figure out what Bitcoin was. Um, it was what, what, what on earth had you built? And I remember we were sitting, I think you were there, it was maybe the end of 2017, in a courtyard at some university in Toronto. And there was a group of us, and there were some, you know, some Danish guys there, there was a lot of you Canadians. And you were telling me about magic cards and how you all met sort of you know, on the internet. And it just dawned on me that Bitcoin when it, you know, the Satoshi's white paper was released just after the GFC, it was it, it was much bigger than people thought it was. Um, and I, I don't believe that Satoshi um, was just a bunch of electrical engineers. I think there was a lot more to it because to write the Bitcoin white paper, um, I think you, you, you had to have a very good understanding, and now what I know now, about how payment systems work, how central banks work, how monetary policy works. So, um, I found that really interesting. So since then, I've spent my entire life um, understanding, reading, figuring out what Bitcoin is, what it was built for. Um, you know, the libertarian side of it is, do, is it is it a currency? Is it a commodity? Um, is it a store of value? What is it? And I and I think it's, it's all of the above. I think it's a... Um, Bitcoin's revolutionary, and 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 one of the other things I met in that that time was Robert Carr. And I, so I'm, you know, as I said, I was a banker, I was a derivatives trader. I mm. understand derivatives trading, and and um, but I didn't know anything about the internet, and I didn't understand anything about coding. So I thought, well, I better learn. Um, so I remember googling who built the internet, and it <laughs> came up with Robert Carr. Yeah. So I. I found Robert's number, an email, and I sent him a message. And I said, "Can you teach me what you about what you built?" And he was, um, he was like, "That is no. so <laughs> funny. That is so funny." <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> and so I think at that event with Perry Ann, I found him, and I and he said. So then he, since that day, he's he's t- taken me under his wing with his wife Patrice, who's a professor of law, I think, at Princeton, yeah. and has taught me about the peer, you know, what, what he built as an open system. Um, you know, when he first, the first thing that he did when he built the internet, he actually sent a message across, across an open network to a guy called Vint Cert, which said hello. Now, that was the beginning of the, the transmission, um, the internet protocol and the transmission control protocol. And on that, what's come out of it has obviously revolutionised our life and changed it. And then I, so I spent a lot of time with him, and I think the one thing that Bitcoin did in my mind mind after figuring out what 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 a peer-to-peer network looks like on an open network was that Bitcoin offered a new security layer to the protocol to the internet protocol that solved the biggest problem of the internet um, which was was this, was it not being secure and I think it also solved the double double spend problem um, of accountants so putting all those little factors together it's it's been a long long haul for me but I think I have one of the greatest mentors on the planet um, that Bob Kahn, who built the internet, and I know far too much now about protocols and electrical engineering and and mathematics than I ever really wanted to know. But <laughs> I, 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 
I actually now understand a lot about open open source protocols and what the internet was and why it was built and how it democratised probably uh, transmission of things like media. And then on top of that has been yeah, the Bitcoin protocol, which solved the security problems of the internet. And you put all those things together, boom. You've just hit the biggest, you know, the fourth industrial revolution of digitalized or revolution, uh, you know, the next, the next level of the internet, which has been pretty exciting. Yeah, it has been. It has been. And so I was going to ask you another question. Um, OECD, uh, that, that was another time that I saw you in the last <laughs> year. Are you able to share anything on that front oh. um, or is that kind of not so much? I mean, oh. I know that they're, I mean, their website is pretty public. I actually found my, yeah. my talk uh, on it. It was like seven layers, like buried deep. Like it was so hard to even get at it. I was like, there, there's no way anyone's watching this, but it's okay. Oh no, we're on the same <laughs> panel. And you, you have at the time, Harvesh, um, who's now the central governor of Mauritius was the, was the, um, was the CEO of the Financial Services Commission in Mauritius, where I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. consultant on FinTech. Yeah, yeah, no, he loves you. He thinks you're a legend. Um, no, and we had the founder of M-Pesa, the, the Minister of IT um, and Technology from Kenya, who was also, who built the M-Pesa, which is, was just yeah, such a revolutionary thing in payments. Um, so Greg, who I told you about who ran ASIC, um, after he finished two terms at ASIC, um, would have been 2000. End of 2018, yeah. Um, and he was the chair of IOSCA, which is the, the council of, the, of all the big regulators around the world for security markets. And Greg has been awesome mm. and instrumental in changing regulation around the world and introducing emerging texts like blockchain and, and um, yeah, AI, probably the most innovative regulator that we've ever seen. And I think his legacy at ASIC um, and at IOSCO was 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 this new direction which regulators are, are, are taking, as in how they can um, mitigate risks of new technology but not not stifle innovation. So he went to the OECD and he became the directorate um, of financial enterprise. He'd been there three days. Uh, I think this was November two thousand. Must have been two thousand and seventeen. It was a long time ago. Anyway, he rang me. He goes, Loretta, they don't know much about blockchain at the OECD. You better come and help me. So I said, okay. So myself, um, I got on a plane that next week with Joseph Weinberg and Ben Yablon. Ben was running Salt. And we went with Greg and we stood in front of an auditorium and I think there was about 1,200 people at it. But the 12,000 employees of the OECD, um, this was broadcast live to, the, live to them. And Joseph was rubbishing on about yeah, Bitcoin being <laughs> the new global currency and Ben was talking about the tokenization <laughs> of assets. And, and the OECD... Yeah, this is a bunch of policy writers, and then their, their their mission statement is better lives, better, better policies, better lives, and and I don't think they'd ever seen a group of people like Ben Joseph and I, um, and we explained blockchain, and from that moment on, they were a little bit dubious. But in the next year, the Secretary General, um, Angel Gorab, decided that blockchain and emerging technologies were going to be on the three most important um, topics for the OECD and all their member companies countries. Okay. So, in and, and, and at this point, I just try to because you had already kind of gone through this process of like blockchain, not Bitcoin or Bitcoin, not blockchain. And you kind of understood it a bit more. So I'm just curious, like, was the kind of the narrative there was more like still blockchain type of thing, or it wasn't still about Bitcoin, right? Like the, these events? Yeah, so, or so we is explained it... to them, well, I explained to them blockchain because everybody hears about Bitcoin and everybody's got these ridiculous notions about Bitcoin's drunk. Yeah, it's only used by money launderers and terrorists and and, and 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 it's not a good thing. But then everyone goes, oh, but blockchain's awesome. And it's like, well, you know, you sort of can't have one without the other. And so I always explain to people, blockchain is the technology that underpins, um, that underpins um, Bitcoin. And Bitcoin was the first application. Yeah. It may not be the last, but to date, Bitcoin, so, you know, the digitalization of, I guess, money um, is the, the only use case that actually works. So there's a lot of pilots, you know, in supply chains and how you can use blockchain for voting rights and all these other, you know, industry verticals. And I think we'll get there. But I always say to, you know, to the OECD, the only use case that actually works at a scalable level at the moment is the, is the digitalization of money. And that's what Bitcoin is. And, and money means a lot of things to different people, you know, whether it be a store of value, whether it be a means of payment. Um, you know, so people understanding that blockchain and Bitcoin um, you know, is one is the technology, one's the application, but they can't be removed from each other. And I think that's, you know, that's the message I've been trying to tell people because in, in my mind, the only use case of blockchain at the moment that works 
is is Bitcoin, is is the digitalization of money. So, hey, Lorena, what is the OECD? Maybe because I think so a lot OECD, of people listening might not even know, and maybe I because I, I always assume you know that people know, but I mean I, I don't I, now that I think about it, I don't think most people would even know what those terms mean. Yeah, and so I because I went, I kind of read up on Wikipedia what they are and stuff. But do you, do you know kind of where where it comes from? No, so at that point, no. So I remember doing the same. So the OECD stands for the Organisation of Economic Development. Mm. Now, after World War Two. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There is a building at the OECD called the Marshall Building, the Marshall Plan. So after Winston yes. Churchill won and the Allies won in 1949, they decided that they would recarve the you know, Europe and um, they would they would they would carve out the path for economic development post World War II. So the Marshall Plan was implemented at the OECD, and it was so it's the economic development arm, and I guess it has um, member countries, all the G20, the G7. So they come up with policies. Um, as I said, the mission statement is better policies for better lives. So they they write all the policies that um, yeah influencing like um, finance ministers and and policies and standards. There's the standard setting body for, for for most of the countries around the world. So the IMF, I always break it down like this: the IMF is the people that give money to different countries. The OECD is the organisation that sits behind that and decides how they're going to give that money and what what yeah how they they pay it back effectively. And there's a number of you know large um, bodies around the world. So there's the OECD that does the, that. You have the IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund. So they give the money, and the OECD figure out how you're going to have that money implemented and how you pay it back. There's the Financial Action Task Force, um, which is the the standard setting body around the world for money laundering, anti money laundering, terrorism financing, which are the people that blacklist countries. So they're important as another organisation. There's the OSCE, the Organisation of Security. Um, in Europe and Asia. And so I guess that's sort of like the NATO version of the OECD. So the OECD is the economic... When, when was the FAT, when was FAT have started? So it started, that was started in the 2000s and it was, it brought together a number of the G20 and or the powers of the world to combat money laundering, terrorism financing. So they're the standard setters under that. So I always say the FATS is the big kahuna of regulators. You have like the SEC and the security regulators that probably sit a layer under that. But all regulation that comes out of the world um, a bit from a securities regulation or commodities regulator still has to uh, still has to be covered off by what the FATF say. So you have these standards of regulators and, and that's the big kahuna because no country and no regulator wants to be in breach of the, the, the financial action task force um, standards and policies. So. Yeah, yeah, and and in the fat of, I mean, so the, are these these are elected officials or people that are like, or how do yeah, these, so how do these members, people so kind of come into these these roles, or is, how how do these like this international body? I'm just really curious about it, uh, and and I think a lot of others are, and 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 where I'm kind of going with all this is, as you know, the travel rule is something that's kind yeah. of impacting the, uh, you know, uh, Brian Armstrong recently tweeted about mm-hmm. it. Um, anyway, so but but it is something that I again I think about. I think others think about maybe they don't. I don't know. I don't really care. Uh, but I'm curious about it. So, so what what are your thoughts on on kind of you know how this is all playing out and uh, uh, yeah. So, so I mean, I come from a I'm a derivatives trader. You know, as I said, I've run banks. So I I have been my entire career for the 30 years that I did it, being used to be regulated by everybody. You know, so, so compliance with regulators for me in my entire career has never been an issue because you have to be compliant when you work for banks and when you, you're trading things like securities, when you're trading commodities, um, yeah, when you, you're ensuring that you, you, you're you making sure that you're not breaching any um, money laundering, terrorist financing um, standards. So I've been used to it. And I guess that's, that's one thing that the industry... Um, of blockchain and Bitcoin are not used to because this is technology, it's innovation that's come out of a bunch of technologists who are not, you know, we're really worried, we've never been really worried about what, what, what the state of regulation is because it hasn't been it hasn't been a, a problem problem but when technology and applications of technology step into the real world um, and you start to dip your toes into does the technology um, um, 
breach or the applications of technology breach things like consumer and investor protection um, and other regulators is it breach AML CTF regulations yeah you have to start to fess up and if you're going to be a, a um, you know a, a mature industry you have to understand how these regulations in, impact everybody and um, and I think that's the difference with me because I understand it and technologists nor should they because I think 95 95 to 99 percent of everybody that uses technology or implements you know tech technology solutions, entrepreneurs, and, and all they care about is building technology. And they do it for the right reasons. But like everything, and I think the internet showed us that, because when the internet came out, as Bob said to me, you know, they just thought it was going to be good for porn. Um, and, you know, when he said when, they, when the internet was first launched, he remember being called in by the government, they were like, shut it down. He's like, well, I can't because there's an open protocol. And then he said, yeah, the same people 10 years later came back to him and said, okay, we need to buy it. He's going, we well, can't buy it because... <laughs> it's open sort of like so um but you know but then as the internet matured it started to have encroachments upon all the different you know parts of the regulators that, that regulate all sorts of stuff so i think um and i and i think people get very confused about what the role of regulators and regu regulation is um regulation is is put there to protect a consumer and investor at a security at as at, you know at a securities level or commodities level aml ctf regulations which are set by the fatf are put there to stop um, the things that we don't like in the world, money laundering, um, drug trafficking, um, you know, human trafficking, all those things that actually none of us want. Mm. Um, and, but 5% of the population that use technology are nefarious actors and they do it, um, we're all not good players. So you, 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 know, you might have 99% of the population of people building businesses that are doing it for the right reasons, but that 1% upsets it for everybody. And I think at the end of the day, if you step book back and say, you know, why do what, why does well, you know, the SEC or why does ASIC or what, you know, why, why do um, regulating bodies be so harsh about the industry and, and why there's such hard AML CTF rules? It's because they need to stop those things that none of us want. You know, we don't want kids being used um, yeah, for pornography or humans traffic. So when you think about it in big context, it, it may not affect you particularly in your business or your, your life, but it affects you know, the world and us as people if we have these things tolerated. So I think it, when you look at it like that, um, yeah, it, it becomes much more a perspective of why we have regulations and, and what and how they protect people as humans. Um, the, the travel rule is an interesting one because you know, I've been a banker for 30 years. Um, under the, 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 the banking system, um, the, when banks move money, you've got to know the beneficial owner of that money and you have to know the person it's going to. So that that apparently stops a lot of the, the nefarious actions um, because the banking system knows who, who transferred money and why. So the FATF came up when they said, all right, if we're going, to, if you're going to do this in, in normal banking systems, then we're going to put it into virtual assets. So the FATF, and I wish um, the ex-secretariat is a very good friend of mine, Rick McDonald, who set it up. He's Australian. We do a lot of work together. I really wish back in 2011, 2012, the FATF would have looked at virtual assets and called them digital assets, but they're called virtual because in my mind, virtual means something doesn't exist. Um, Bitcoin cryptocurrencies are part of the new digital assets and they exist. They, yeah, hello, they, they're there. So I think, um, yeah, but so they, they've put all these rules that anybody transferring money through a VASP, a virtual asset service provider, which, yeah, which is comprehensively um, comprises of people exchanges or what you know, big digital asset marketplaces or what you call them, and anybody interacting with any service that, that is around, evolves around virtual assets have to comply to the travel rule. Now, I think the industry was a little bit um, upset with that. But as you know, technology can solve many, many problems. And I think the industry has solved its own problem of understanding who the beneficial owner is, the wallet address, and who, um, you know, and who that money has been sent to in, in, the, in the world of AML CTF. So the FATF worry about transactions, um, the banking system over $10,000. Um, so you have to report in the normal financial um, markets and financial world any transaction above $10,000 $10, that you think suspicious. So they've effectively put that into the virtual asset space, i.e. Um, cryptocurrencies and anything related to that. And they're, they're now saying that you need to be able to verify on, um, on a cryptocurrency exchange who, 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 the buyer, who the buyer of that is and who you're sending it to. And you have to know the legal person behind that. So I, effectively, I guess it's the beneficial ownership. 
Got it. Got it. And then, um, what was what was your I guess kind of role with the OECD? Were you an advisor there or just a participant? At the oh event? no, I was. Yeah, I was. I was originally part of the the think tank that started mm. to work on the blockchain. Um, I still interact with them all the time, um, you know. But I interact with a lot of a lot of organisations, and I, and I think the OECD, when we started to do this, um, took up the concept of what blockchain was and its effect across all different sectors and all different industry verticals. Mm. And they were the one international body that really tried to sort of start to set standards. Um, across across different nations um as i said like the g20 is part of the oecd but there's a lot of members countries a lot of other countries that aren't members are still part of it um and i think that's been important because it's built it's brought a lot of credibility um and standards to an industry like, like the internet if the internet um you know took 30 years for regulations and standards to be built around internet protocol um if we could do that much, much quicker in, in the, the new world of digital assets, um, it's going to have mass adoption much faster. And I think that's the key. It's like, you know, these things can stay on the outside um, of, of, of mainstream. But I think when we start setting standards from an industry perspective and also regulations that, that, you know, that, that allow you to become mainstream, you're going to see a much better adoption of things like um, digital assets because they, they become mainstream. And it took the internet 30 years, 30 extra years, because we didn't have any standards and regulations. And I learned this from Bob Kahn's wife, Patrice, because as I said, she's a professor of law at Princeton. And behind every good man, there's a woman. And without her, Bob would not have been able to have launched the internet the way that it was. She was the, the lawyer that stood behind him and wrote the regulations and the standards that effectively built the internet. And that, that one couple taught me that if, unless you have regulations and standards set, nothing has a mass adoption. And I think the internet has shown us that mass adoption um, from open protocols and open source work um, yeah, is pretty powerful because I think everybody on the planet uses at least one device that comes out of the, the transmission control protocol. Hey, Loretta, did you hear, I'm trying to remember because uh, uh, like, have we spoken after uh, the time we met in Paris? I don't know. I think so. Um, because did, did, did you know about, do you know about the news in India, obviously, like the good news uh. of what happened? Yes. So I, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so on that, um, I've been very vocal, as you know, that's one of my other things about India, because I think, you know, India being the, 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 the country it is, I worked with you at Unicoin. Um, at the moment, I'm now an advisor to, um, to a think tank on regulations that comes under the Ministry of Good Governance um, in India. It's a think tank for all the regulatory bodies of India. And I'm trying to give them a framework um, that regulates um, digital assets, of which is a, a cryptocurrency, that is, is, are a subset. Give them the proper regulatory framework so they don't ban anything. Because I think, you know, um, obviously after the the Reserve Bank of India went to court and tried to have um, cryptocurrencies banned, and that didn't work. India has to rethink now that which which pathway she goes down. And I think banning anything is not good, especially in somewhere like India where you have, you know half the population is born after 1991. They all have access to a telephone. You can't ban technology. And I think India has got some of the smartest um, developers, tech savvy people in the world. So I, I hope that India um, starts to listen and she doesn't try and ban things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but she understands the, the benefits and, and, and the benefits of blockchain in total. And we have a proper regulatory framework um, as I've built in other jurisdictions to, to to, to suffice that that issue. Um, I'm working on it really hard. India's, as you know, Sunny, it's, it's me and I lived there for a long time. It's a long haul. She's like a big elephant. If you walk next to her and pat her on the head, she'll be fine. But if you stand behind her and tell her to move forward, she'll kick you and she'll probably kill you. Um, it's, a, it's a good analogy I use with India. So yeah, so India never does anything quickly. Um, I think she's on the right path. Um, I think with COVID, um, the issues she's having up on the borders with, um, India's got a lot of problems at the moment. And I think this is probably on the back burner, but I hope that it's one that I can help to solve and give them a proper regulatory framework um, that manages you know, their regulation and um, is, is beneficial for India. So that's something else I'm working on, which I've forgotten about, but that's a big one. 
Very interesting. Very interesting. Hey, uh, I don't think you talked about, um, you know, in Australia, you put together a framework, right? For a, Am I mistaking that, that you had shared with me? I remember at one point um, in terms of like how to regulate digital currencies and whatnot. Uh, did we touch on that already today? Did you, do you know what so I'm we referring to that, first of all or no? Um, um, I don't think we did. So when I first met you and I was still at the, I was the advisory chair at the Australian Digital Chamber of Commerce, which is now a th morphed into Blockchain Australia, we came up with the self-regulation around Bitcoin. And I think we were one of the first jurisdictions to do that. So that mm, was like an self -regulation. industry. Self-regulation, right, yeah. right. Mm, interesting. And that was very important because it, it gave um, the industry some proper regu some, some proper standards to follow um, in in the absence of formal regulation. And oh, I, I've done that in a lot of jurisdictions since because I think you have to have a push from industry to go, all right, mm. nobody wants to regulate us because nobody understands what we do. We'll regulate ourselves. And I think that's the first step to, to being um to start on the on the process of, of being considered to be a, a, a proper industry to be recognised by the policy makers. Um, and so we started that in Australia. I think now there's like 37 countries in the world that have adopted a very similar um, reg regulatory framework, self-regulation framework. I've given it to the Indians, as you know, multiple times. I keep giving it. Um, we, I've done it across you know, Serbia, Romania, um, Australia, my, a lot of the Caribbean. So I think that's the first step. And then on the other side of it, obviously, is, is working with regulators and policymakers to make them, A, understand the technology, or yeah, B, get rid of the, mis, the misconceptions about what Bitcoin is. And, and because policymakers um, and regulators are not technologists. They'd be, and technologists are not, are not regulators or policymakers. So you have this you have this balancing act um, where you need to bring them together in some sort of fashion to make sure that the regulations and policies that have been implemented at a country level or a, reg, reg, um, a regulator's level um, don't stifle innovation, but they set the boundaries for the industry to ensure that the rules and the laws are not going to change on you in a year or two years. Um, and I think that's that's been... That's been hard, but it's been very important. And as I said to you before, like in Australia, coming up with the term a digital asset, of which a, a cryptocurrency is just a subset, we we did this legal framework in Mauritius. I've done it in Bermuda. Um, it's ready to roll out across the 53 countries of the Commonwealth because guess what? We all have exactly the same legal system that the English gave us. Whereas if I tried to do this in the US or I tried to do this in Europe, there's so many regulators, like a big jar of spaghetti. You've got different regulators that have different views and it does. It, it's very hard to implement. But across the Commonwealth, generally you have one securities regulator, um, yeah, one regulator of AML CTF. And, um, when you, and mature markets like Canada, Australia, the UK and the other 50 countries that are part of the Commonwealth, my, my view is for the next five years, if I can align all those frameworks, obviously they're a bit different in country, but if I can align them, then that's very powerful. And I think the likes of Europe and the US will follow once they can see like you know, the, the, there's proper regulatory frameworks that protect the consumer and investor, stop you know, money launderers and terrorists, but also give you as the industry in blockchain and crypto um, yeah, proper frameworks that means that you know, nobody's going to come and try and arrest you in two years for breaking the law. But, you know, um, in terms of like, just to kind of quickly touch back on that travel rule thing, I think one of the things that is a bit concerning is, is that they, that they want to make it so that you can't, that people might not be able to send funds from centralized exchanges to their self-hosted wallets. And I think I even heard something even far more uh, or scarier as well about nodes recently. I don't know if that got yeah. like, but, but I'm just saying is, is like, so um, yeah, any thoughts on that? I mean, just like in terms of advice to like regulators, like, you know, cause again, the FATF guidelines are more guidelines, right? So now the next yeah. step is for regulators around the world to take those guidelines and adopt them and, and, and as, as they see fit. Yeah. As they see fit. Yeah. So, so any, 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 I don't know, I guess, you know, I mean, it's kind of like weird to even talk about regulations, right? Like as a Bitcoiner <laughs> in general, right? Like I'm not uh, like, just to be clear, like I'm not like, you know, a, a huge, yes. like I'm not like necessarily advocating for regulations, but we do live in a world with rules, yeah. right? And and whether we like them or not are, are just somewhat like secondary, uh, secondary matter, right? Like, uh, but understanding what they are and being able to, yeah. you know, um, uh, like kind of figure out like why the world has them, like you said, whether it's like, you know, money laundering or, or you know, terrorist financing or 
um, child trafficking. I mean, like, I think most people are pretty unanimously against things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, but it, but again, like, but this whole KYC and ML thing, right? So there's that that side of it, the DEXs, the use, self user, the self hosted yeah. wallets, and all that. Um, but then there's also this other, you know, side where I don't know if you heard, but just today an article came out on CoinDesk about how FinCEN is like the biggest yeah. honeypot of like KYC information in the world, and it's just a matter of time. We you know you've heard of Equifax, you've heard of, you know, TransUnion. So like centralizing people's KYC data doesn't feel it's like good. it's probably the right way either. So, so how do, yeah. how does the world figure this out? <laughs> it's like kind of a big, yeah. big task. But I know it's a really, it's an important one. And yeah, for me, the problem is that nobody talks the same language. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I found that for the last number of years, you know, when I talk to central banks and what's one of the biggest problems that central banks have and the GFC, because I was a trader in the GFC, is, um, was the fact that the, the banks went under. So the GFC, you know, effectively happened because um, a whole lot of people were sitting in, in big banks around the world and hedge funds that had a whole lot of people trading algorithms and were sitting uh, in bubbles in their dealing rooms and they were talking about black pools, dark pools. Nobody actually un understood one word they were saying, so they said yes. Because um, to, to be the head of a big bank or a big institution, to admit that you don't understand something is not, not generally how the world has worked. So you're better off to say yes than, than no. And I think, um, you know, that was one of the problems of the GFC. Had people understood, you know, the, the options, the, the, the naked options that were trading underneath Lehman Brothers and, you know, and, and all the problems that occurred with the GFC, we can probably now fix with technology. And decentralised systems obviously you know, take out those honeypots of attack um, from the security basis of these databases. And, I, and that's why I'm an advocate of decentralised databases, because I think um, Bitcoin has proven that it's the only database in the world that's not been hacked ever. That's it. And so that, on a technical level, you know, I don't care what anybody says to me, the government, boom. You have the first database that has never actually been hacked. Now, exchange has been hacked and all those things around that um, yeah, are superfluous to that because, but they don't understand that the understanding of the technology is a secure, immutable, transparent database that cannot be hacked. So if we decentralize databases, and you're right, we are have things are having you know, honey box, honey pots of, of centralized databases because they're they're great to hack. Because once you hack one, you, you, you know, you can you can break into governments, you can break into policymakers. Every company in the world's been hacked. I mean, that's the thing. I think every government database in the world has been hacked. We now have technology that stops that. But there's not a great understanding of that. And I think, um, yeah, for for my, my plea is that regulators and policymakers around the world educate themselves because I think, um, as I said, the GFC happened because people weren't educated in how algorithms work. And, and I think, um, yeah, we've moved too far in the world to not be educated. It's the onus of a regulator and a policymaker and somebody who runs a company to understand cybersecurity and understand the basis of technology. You know, how you code. I mean, I'm an advocate. I think that every, every regulator and every policymaker should have a basic level of understanding of coding um, because most of them don't. And, and that, 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 that's a big problem. But I think these rules come out of fear. They, they come out of um, losing control. Because I think you know, if, if you look at the, the, the what was the, the, the mission of Bitcoin? It was, the, it was the libertarians that believed that, yeah, that anarchy and total privacy would, is the way forward. I think on the other side of it, you have governments and regulators that, um, that want total control. And that's not going to work either. And I think the GF showed us that. But this world of anarchy and total libertar libertarianism doesn't work either. So there has to be somewhere in the middle that works. But we have to work from both sides to make that work. Um, I plea to regulators that they don't ban things be just because they don't understand them. I think the travel rule comes out of financial markets. You know, we, 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 we've been governed by rules around traditional financial markets for hundreds of years. Now, that was purpose built, but that's not how this technology takes us forward and decentralised you know, exchanges and wallets and DeFi scares the living daylights out of me because what regulators do, they generally regulate the intermediary to look after the consumer investor. But all of a sudden we've removed the intermediary and, you know, we've got, we've, we've got people um, trading DeFi with, with nothing more than a wallet address. Um, that's a scary concept too and I'm not understanding quite how... We have a lot of projects that have food 
that all talk about, you know, the project that are related to food. How the hell a regulator or somebody's going to take me seriously when I go in to try to explain DeFi? Um, but, I, but I think understanding the technology and the benefits it brings to systems far out great, far, far outweighs the risks of things like um, you know, cryptocurrency. And I don't think, to be in, in my, my humble opinion, I don't think that they're going to be able to implement these, these rules to stop because this technology came from, from the shadows. Um, you can't stop technology. I can't stop my, my 16 year old using you know, her, her telephone 23 out of 24 hours a day. Um, and, I, and I can't regulate technology. I can only regulate um, you know, the on-ramps and the off-ramps and the people that, that the services that, and um, service providers that use that technology. But if they try and ban things like Bitcoin, um, it'll just go back to the shadows. And you will never have a hope in hell of being able to regulate um, and make these things mainstream. So, you know, for me, that's my personal mission is to make sure that, that, that regulators and policymakers and think sensibly about why they're implementing rules. Is it just because they're fear, fearful of losing control? Um, or is it, but yeah, is it is it is it because they don't they don't understand how the positive impacts of, of um, the technology can be? But it's also a thing, you know. Um, I always say to blockchain companies I advise and, and and crypto companies that I advise, I say, you know, don't go to a country that's got no regulation because it may be good in the short term. Um, Overregulation is really bad. No regulation is even worse because you, as companies, what are you trying to do? You're trying to build companies. Um, you need to have a level of regulation and regulated somewhere that allows you to go back into mature markets. Because if you start in an unregulated market, you're never going to be able to go back into a mature market. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Continue. Sorry. I thought. I thought. No, no. That's it. No, that was, yeah, yeah. Loretta, was Loretta uh, you know, you, you, you started your whole career, like you said, in derivatives. I'm just curious, have you had much experience in, in the crypto derivative space? Like, have you? Um... Now, yes. And I and I get very, very upset about this all the time because I've got a whole bunch of 25 and 26 year olds telling me, you know, and they're doing DeFi and they're, yeah, they're doing asset, they're, they're arbitraging different projects against each other. Yeah. I mean, I did all that with a piece of paper and a pen in 1991. Had I have had the technology, we didn't have a computer. We had like telephones. Like had, I mean, you're a, you're a trader or you're not a trader. It's a gut thing. I mean, I can still trade any asset class and I, I know that I can do it, um, you know, in, I can add up in my head. But what, you know, it's, it's funny because all the, the crypto derivatives traders think that they're, you know, they're guns and yeah, because you, um, you do things a lot faster, and more efficient than we ever did as traders in the 90s. But hey, I didn't have the technology on a piece of paper. So go up against me with a piece of paper and pencil and tell me how good you are if you, <laughs> if you don't have this technology to trade a derivative. I mean, you know, so um, yeah, I do. And I, I Is, derivative and, and, markets are yeah. fun. Yeah, right. They're, they're, they're risky, you know. If, and I yes. think that's one thing I tell people. What is the one thing? I've traded every asset class on the planet. Um, asset classes do not go one way forever. Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. This is like, you know, <laughs> yeah. every asset class goes up and goes down. Um, beware. Buyer beware is all I think regulators can say. Yeah, and, and it's understanding your risk. And the risk, I think the risk tolerance of the millennials and even my daughter at 16 is much, much better. She is, you know, understands risk and risk management much better than I even did at 30 because she's got a telephone and, and the internet and has given us access to information faster. So we're still trying to regulate in a world where we think the consumer investor is stupid. But they're not. So my argument is to regulators, the millennials understand risk better than anybody ever did. So we have to start to regulate, um, explaining, all right, buyer beware, enter at your own peril. Um, we can't stop you doing it, but we'll just tell you that there's risk and there's risk in every asset class. And don't think crypto, you know, crypto assets are any different. Don't think that digital assets are any different because there will always be markets, forces that put things up when they go down. So I always say to people, don't invest any more money, which has been the golden rule of my life for the last 35 years, in something in, in, and that you can't afford to lose. Hey, so, hey, hey. 
Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that's great, by the way. I think that's a great piece of advice. Hey, Loretta, but what do you think now? Um, I mean, like, wow. I mean, if we if we saw each other a year ago, I mean, so much has happened. Um, oh just, God. you know, the macro conditions are insane, right? Like with, well, with micro strategy, putting, I don't know, half a billion dollars in. You've got insurance company today. I forget the name of the, the, the insurance company, but put a, I mean, an insurance company, me- their job is to measure risk. <laughs> so for them to be excited about Bitcoin and to be putting a hundred million dollars in is I think yeah. another trend. Um, you're hearing Ray Dalio, um, you know, Mr. Wonderful, uh, sorry, uh, Kevin O'Leary. You're hearing all these people that are, you know, uh, that are, that are getting excited. So, so curious. Um, wh- how do you think that's going to impact you know, your world in terms of like regulators thinking about this, because, because when I saw you, they had the Facebook Libra guy on stage. Oh. That was like oh. probably one of the most, like, I don't know. Oh, I mean, that's, I'm sorry, Facebook and Libra, <laughs> for God's sake, you're not even a blockchain. You're a one tree Merkel dude. Like, but I mean, but yeah, what Facebook did with that, and it was the best marketing, yeah, yeah. History, in, marketing history in history. They went, okay, what's the one, what the one, what the one, um, yeah, use case that works. It's the digitalization of money. Hello, that's what Bitcoin does, and it's still the only thing that works. How do we make money of of capitalizing that? It was, I mean, the the whole thing about Libra. I mean, in my personal opinion, it's not going to work, and it's not a blockchain, and it's yeah, it's. It, it, there's a but lot I love of the fact that they they, they but, but they I would say single handedly made. Yeah like this industry super relevant because people oh. might or may or may not care about Bitcoin, but, but whether you care, you that. have to care about Facebook because yeah. it's on your phone most likely. So like that was, yeah, they, I thought like this. It. Oh. it was great because I remember when we were talking about the OECD and regulators, I started talking about stable coins in 2017 and central bank digital currencies. And I remember walking in, I think it was Joseph and, and um, Samson Mao into the central bank of Canada. And I've done a number so far. And the boys going, oh yeah, the Bitcoin protocols and you know what we can do. And these guys were sort of looking at them and, and, I mean, I've been talking about the you know, central bank digital currency since then. Everybody thought I was mad. I mean, like, Shh, don't mention the Bitcoin. Shh. Like, don't mention you know, the stable coins. I mean, these things now move on three years later. Every central bank is looking after Facebook to implement a central bank digital currency, which I haven't, it's a whole different conversation because I think we need to be careful what we wish for there. But move on mm. from what I was talking about three years ago. Everybody knows about stable coins. Every central bank's calling me going, oh, we need a central bank digital currency. I'm like, why and because facebook brought to the top of the conversation that who dares all of a sudden a tech company can effectively rival the sovereign a sovereign nation and the only people that could stand up against facebook um, as a nation is probably china so th- it was it pushed the conversation to the edge everybody mm. and always would come in, no no go away no no no, no. what you're talking about it's not going to happen in our lifetime we don't care we don't need to understand it but all of a sudden libra pushed the conversation to the edge and everyone's going we might be irrelevant oh my god and i think what we've seen through covid this year and to 2020 has been the best social experiment in history. I mean, all the stuff, and we were told that nobody could work from home. Everybody, now everybody's now on Zoom calls, working from home. I'm stuck in a little room. Um, I've been busier, you know, in quarantine 24 hours a day than I actually ever had when I was flying around the world. As, and it, but it's funny, but, you know, and people not using cash, this concept of digital money, um, you know, mobile money has just been pushed to the forefront of every conversation. And Bitcoin has proven because of the last 10 years, had I had a dollar or a Bitcoin, every time everyone said to me, oh, this thing's going to go away. It's not relevant. It's not important. I'd be a very wealthy woman at this point. I wish I had more, more Bitcoin. <laughs> but I think um, with stimulus packages, and as I said, oh you know, it's been a fixed income trade of my life. I'll tell you, after the GFC, printing money does not work. All it does is push the cra- the, ca- the you know the trash can down the end of the street. It's going to hit the next generations, and I think that's what I see with my daughter, um, with all the millennials. And for the first time in history, they're going, really, governments and central banks? You think we're that stupid? You think we're going to pay all this off with our tax to the next generations? So I think everybody underestimated the reach of things like Bitcoin. And what you've seen now is going, hmm, all right, this is a particularly good alternative. It's digital gold. I mean, I always say to somebody, um, you know, if I was in three assets that I would own, real estate in Sydney, because they're never going to go down, um, 
gold in physical and Bitcoin, digital gold. These are three assets that I've given to my daughter because I think they are the three assets that are going to be particularly particularly good and and relevant Mm. in 10 to 20 years. So I think Bitcoin has got a lot more momentum because people are going, and so do you, but I was asking someone the other day, a good friend of mine, Raoul Powell, who a, was a correlation trader you know with him? me in the 90s. Yes, I've been into oh, and I do. We tweet together. He we were correlation you. traders in the 90s, um, yeah. as well like Paul Tudor Jones. Like, so everybody in the industry thinks that we're all quite stupid if we're over 50. Let me tell you, as traders, we're all still quite good. And those of us that understand the technology are even better. So, you know, and we were, you know, we were, Big correlation traders, and we could move across asset classes on on you know on computers once every three hours because we'd have contact with people all around the world. And and I think what technology has done is has taken the whole world and, and smashed it into being a small village. So you know the, the 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 frequency of information and trading and and I think a lot of with Bitcoin's volatility and the immaturity markets that you've seen over the last 10 years has cautioned the mainstream trader. And I say this, as I said, you know, I, I traded green bonds in the 90s. Immature asset classes are very volatile. And that, that's just because they're immature. But I think what you've seen, you know, from what was it in January, Bitcoin was at 3,000. And now what are we sitting at today? 19,000? Well, Canadian is 25. Yeah, American yeah. is 19, so, 18 something. You know, there is no, there is, you know, in the probability of events, um, I think you've probably seen the low now, but you can never in a free market guarantee that the the highs and lows don't change. And I always say to people, just be careful. But I think what you're seeing now, and also we are with with derivatives being implemented on Bitcoin and crypto assets globally, um, the the mainstream traders or the the financial institutions who were were very concerned even two years ago, even a year ago, are now going, all right, this has got to the point that we have to have some exposure. Whether, and I think with the uh, the announcement of Circle, you know, the likes of the Soros's, the Paul Judah Jones, everybody that was still not believing two years ago, even a year ago is going, "Mm, we have to, um, because of the amount of thing, hold some sort of risk, some sort of, say, yeah, some sort of um, number of this in our portfolios. And I think that's what you'll be seeing with central banks. Um, I don't think it's the be all and end all. and And I don't think, yeah, in my life, to Bitcoin is going to become the, the global currency that the under 30s tell me because there's a lot of different reasons. But I do think it is now setting stone as a new asset class and people have to be exposed for that. And even the, the, the die-heart fundamental you know, financial institutions that you know, still want to hold US dollars and gold, that's fine. Um, I think that everybody and of these institutions will hold at least up to 10%, maybe not over that, but at least up to 10% in their, in their portfolios going forward. So that I think has, has cemented um, the foundations for the, for the price to increase. But as I said, you know, there might be an exogenous event. Um, we were talking about it the other day in a chat that I have um, and someone said, oh yeah, Bitcoin goes to 100,000, goes to a million. I said, right, worst case scenario, let's take the fact that if the internet got knocked out tomorrow and there was a power shortage. <laughs> So you've got to think about this and went, oh, and 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 should countries be putting all their you know their their reserve assets into Bitcoin now? Probably not. You know, in a macro macro style, that's probably not a good way to manage a small nation because you're still subject to the volatility. No much more than you are than having a US dollar, Canadian dollar, Australian, whatever, euro exposure, but it cemented itself as being in that bucket of assets that you need to have some exposure to. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, hey, by the way, I just realized like time's kind of been flying oh. on this call here. Um, but, but I was going to ask you a few more questions before we. Um, so, uh, is is there one truth that you hold that you think most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? And it might be related to what we talked about, maybe something different. But that Bitcoin is not going to be the reserve currency of the world anytime soon. Okay, and by soon you mean ten years? In my life. No, no, in your no, life, no, you don't no, think it will no, become. I, a... only, I reckon I've got another. Well, I'm 51, so I reckon. Uh, uh, yeah, if as a as a punter, I'd say I've probably got at least maybe uh, 30, maximum 40 years left in me. But I don't think in my lifetime. Um, I'm not. I don't even think in my daughter's lifetime. But I think everybody should, un, at least if they don't like Bitcoin, they should understand it and base their their investment decisions on that. And I think my little 16 year old. 
um, you know, accidentally because she hangs out with all of you guys in, in, in the world of Bitcoin. She probably lost a couple, which I probably wish she hadn't have because it might have paid for her education in the next couple of years. But I think everybody should look to have some yeah, you know, some exposure as they do in their their traditional portfolios. For, you know, for you 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 did say the one thing that I think I think you said is you said that you you but you do you think in your lifetime central banks will hold it on their balance sheets? Yeah, I think yes. the central banks will hold it in some in some form um in some way. They won't hold it in all their reserves. I mean, that makes no sense. Come on, guys, you gotta understand when from yeah. I'm also an economist from a macroeconomics perspective. That's not Let gonna me, make any sense. But that, that to me is kind of like the holy grail. Like meaning if, if, if we're living in a world where like all the central banks are fighting over one another to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheets, in my eyes, like that's like as mainstream, like what more mainstream, well, yeah, so PayPal bigger. to accept it. Oh, done, yeah. check. That happened earlier this year. Yeah. yeah. So it, 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 so, I mean, if it, 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 it could, PayPal, 350 million people just like that overnight now yep. has exposure i mean oh my goodness you never know you never know and the other thing is is have you heard of the singularity which uh you know insinuates that you may you may live far longer than you think <laughs> it's dangerous nobody wants to see me running around as a 122 year old woman at a blockchain conference I'm sure, I'm going to show you. <laughs> and if I am, you can shoot me. Because no, oh, we all no. go back in time. I don't know. You got to read the book. <laughs> I'll send it to you. Um, but it, but okay. I think it's very important that, like that, that um, you know, it, 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 it's important that whether we like it or we don't, and I, and 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 I think this is what regulators are itchy about, and what um, central banks are itchy about. Whether we like it or we don't, Bitcoin is here to stay. And if I think Satoshi's vision. Um, for what we all think, and those of us who believe in Bitcoin as strongly, I think Satoshi's vision is 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 starting to be realised as a peer to peer electronic, tra um, you know, cash transfer. And I, and I, in my belief though, I I think Satoshi, in one say way or form, had to have an understanding of central banks and how they they. It, it, this is this can't be a total accident that a bunch of kids and electrical engineers, you know came across this boom it, 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 it makes no no sense in my mind and I you know I, I find this the greatest tale in history and I follow it every day because I think <laughs> I think Satoshi had to have some understanding of how central banks work and monetary systems well he's agreed to come on the show next week so no I'm kidding uh yeah right uh okay okay and then do you think much about AI Yes, I think about AI every day and it worries me when I get dementia because I can assure you when I have dementia, the AI um, algorithm is not going to be able to figure out what I do in, in two seconds. Yeah, I think about it. But I think, um, yeah, and everybody's talking about AI now, but I think what you're seeing, AI won't survive on its own. And yeah, blockchain as a technology doesn't survive on its own. Internet of things. I think what we're seeing now is this acceleration of technology that's gone boom. Um, that is seeing all these different emerging technologies start to come together. And that's going to be really powerful, I think, over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, poor regulators, they can't get their head around separately, you know, let alone more together. But I think, yeah, um, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of the conversations are going to be a lot more around how all these technologies combine to be one, to be one I guess, malleable um, technology that that in in encompasses a lot of different technologies together ai scares me um i yeah, i do worry about um I, I do worry about things like nuclear bombs being detonated but maybe that's because i'm a mother of a kid and and i and and um yeah as i said does an ai have emotion i still don't think that somebody can tell me if i have dementia that the ai algorithm can can predict what i do so i i think ai has its place um i don't think it's going to be the be all and end all i hope um for humanity because i don't think having systems run how we are as people that we love and we hate is um is good like, I would hope to think that we're still relevant as human beings in 50 years. Hey, and Loretta, one more question. Did you all, did you get a chance to watch uh, Yanni from uh, eToro? Uh, he started a project called Good Dollar. He, he actually presented at uh, the OECD conference that we talked about several times. He, I think you were sitting in front of me when, when he was presenting. Maybe you were yeah, I remember. busy with something yeah, else. So but did, did you listen to that in Good Dollar yeah. project? 
So it's essentially UB, uh, universal basic income on a block. On, I think the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but 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 curious, like, do you do you think much about universal basic income? Is there? Or do I do you- a lot. Yeah, I do. Okay. I, and I, I, know, I know this is where the Bitcoin has come from. And I think this this whole pandemic has shown us a number of things that the you know, there's so many people that have been affected by this pandemic. And, you know, even in Australia, in Canada, people that have just overnight lost their jobs that are told they have to sit in a tiny room that, um, you know, that, is, that, that are stuck with no jobs, no savings, no money. Um, what happens? So I think universal basic income is going to be quite relevant in the next few years because out of this pandemic, it's not going to go away. The economic and, and, and social and mental toll, I think that this pandemic has taken on us this year is going to, to change a lot of the way that we think, um, the, the, a lot of the way that governments you know, implement economic um, change and social change. So yes, and I, and I think if you look at somewhere like New Zealand, I think um, Jacinta, the Prime Minister, has been discussing this in the last six months. I think there, there will be jurisdictions that think it's important. And, I mean, look at look at India. I mean, that's one of the things I was thinking. They, there's people people around the world that don't have any, any food to eat this week. Um, you know, we, we have to solve these problems of humanity before we, we, yeah, we start talking about trillions of dollars that have been poured into industries and companies because at the end of the day, you know, I... I it's wrong. It doesn't add up. But I think it, you, that is going to be um, a topic that is going to become more widely um, debated over the next five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think about that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, especially especially Yanni's project. Just because I got to get him on the show. But uh, it's 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 very fascinating to me. You know, like a private. Like private meaning, like not a public, not a government necessarily, but like something that's open source, that's like driven by people, and and it's for the people. To me, I can get behind that. I don't like the idea of inflation yeah. and you know and all the other things that go along with uh, with kind of the normal UB. But anyways, okay. So where yeah. do people? Um, hey, but I, I was gonna ask you, how do you um, kind of like sum up? what you do is are you like an like a re- re- blockchain regulatory advisor of sorts is that accurate yeah. or other yeah? than being the central bank governor whisperer which i've taken on as my title because because <laughs> i think central bank digital currencies are going to be um are going to be the very the, the focus of central banks to keep relevance because i mean i was talking to somebody the other day i think Raul, and we were talking about you know um economic and um, fiscal and monetary policy the monetary policy just got out the door um you got a whole lot of people that are sitting with no money in their their bank accounts i think central banks starting to helicopter money directly into people's wallets is probably going to be a good idea i don't know how technically that looks at the moment but so yeah so i i try and um be the the person that oh yeah the the mature adult at the table that does come from a very regulated financial markets background and I try and translate what all you guys do in Bitcoin in, loosely into some way that regulators and governments and policy makers can understand it um, because I think sometimes the ecosystem has um, and and just because you're all smart you know computer science and 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 technologists you forget that people like me over 50 didn't come from a world of learning everything on a computer or most telephone. We learned everything in a book. So you need to be able to, um, you know, translate technology in normal speak into how policy and regulators look at writing policy and regulators. So that's what I do. Um, I, I, I'm a regulatory, I guess, and advisor on, on emerging tech, especially um, especially blockchain and the subcategory of that being um, crypto assets. Okay, well, this has been, uh, you know, amazing. I know you're a busy lady, so I don't want to take up uh, your whole day. Hey, by the way, Raul, he's on my list of people that I'd love to oh, he's a dude. even though I don't I don't really know him, but uh, I'll introduce you because Raul is oh, a dude. That'd be crazy. He's, he's my Twitter. Uh, he's my, my Twitter crush. Um, yeah, I, nice. and, it's, and I love the fact there's people like him and there's people like me and there's people like Paul Shooter Jones that come from that very traditional world that are standing up going, all right, everybody, you may not understand Bitcoin, but you, you, no, you might like it, but you need to start to understand it. And I think that's the one message I want to say. You may not like it, but you better understand it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Cool. Um, where do people learn more about you? LinkedIn, Twitter, oh, well, website? Yeah. Is there some? No, you LinkedIn and Twitter are my um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Link, LinkedIn and Twitter um is is where I put most of the stuff that I do or I talk about. It used to be more exciting when I could put pictures, but because I'm stuck in a little room and I have yeah, I don't think that's going to change in the next year. 
Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we can get out all out of this here. This has been. <laughs> I am. I am on Instagram though. I do. I think pictures speaks a thousand words. And uh, what's my handle? The real crypto mama. The real I crypto like mama. That. Love it. <laughs> love it. Love it. Okay. I, I do. Like I feel like I. I feel like I'm like. Um, I'm the 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 mature person in the room, but I'm also the 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 lady that stands in front of you know the the ecosystem and fights. Um, and fights for you guys because I do understand it, and, and I and I, if people ban this and governments and policymakers, you know, continue to think that it's it's not going to be with them forever, then they're wrong. So I, you know, I'm very happy to be the person that stands up for the industry, and and then rightly or wrongly, the person that policymakers listen to. So happy to continue to do that. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a, it's a tough. I think it's a tough role to be playing. To be honest, I think. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, like I said, it's, it's a slippery slope, but it's also like a it's like a pink elephant, right? That people don't love to talk about. Um, but I, I do think people need to talk about it because you yeah. know it's like nuanced. There's a lot of there's a lot of moving pieces, and uh, and yeah. So hopefully we you know shed a bit of light, and then you know people can follow up with you maybe on LinkedIn or Twitter yes. if they want to talk to you. And further. I have a hashtag. I have two. We're all Let's in this oh. together, and collaboration is the new survival. Because I think those two things are, are really important. And collaboration to me, um, to bring the industry into the dialogue with the policymakers and the governments is the most important thing that I can do. 100%. Great. I love it. I love your energy, everything you do for the industry. <laughs> I know you, you've uh, had some really interesting meetings with uh, Harish and the guys as well. And you're good friends with Joseph and everyone I hang out with. So <laughs> it's all just one uh, you know group of friends. So I love it. Um, hey, uh, Loretta, so... I think that covers most of it. Yeah, I think that covers everything, you know. Um, yeah, and we're at the kind of the end of the 90 minutes. So thanks again. I guess we can bring it to an end. If, yes, unless you had any like so parting much. messages. <laughs> um, let's hope that, that the shit show of 2020 is over and, and, and 2021 is a new dawning. And any, 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 any parting messages to people kind of like, you know, building on Bitcoin? Oh. Hang on, I lost you. People building yeah. on Bitcoin, right? Because I think a lot of times people get scared of regulators. They sometimes don't want to go into this Bitcoin space because you know it's there's a lot of gray kind of area. But any anything you should maybe you want to maybe tell people because that's one of the main reasons I'm doing this podcast yeah. is to kind of encourage yeah. others. Well, to... I think it's like if you don't like regulators and but you don't need to speak to them, speak to someone like me because I'm very good at translating the message. Don't be scared. I mean, I think that's the regulators are you know, big angry people. We're not and regulators are not technologists you've got to remember that and technologists you guys are not regulators mm. um but if you don't talk it ain't ever going to get better so i think that's you know important thing and i think people are always scared of what regulators do all they do is try and protect consumers and investors and i said at a bigger you know um into aml ctf they just try and stop the bad things like none of us want kids to be trafficked none of us want um you know we want all the bad things we don't want exactly. people terror blowing up so think of it in the in the macro in the bigger picture it's not what you do as an individual company um it's how we act as humanity and make yeah make the world a better place for all of us to live absolutely okay cool okay awesome Loretta. and again if you want to well with raul or even without raul uh next week next month next whenever i'm down to do a follow-up but yeah, with that he's, I'll, a, uh, he's a dude I mean, yeah. I think, you know, you should speak to Alan Tudor Jones too because he's also a dude. Oh, man, I don't know these guys. I know of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is, in the days of telephones in the 90s, we all had to know each other because it was, you know, because they, they couldn't trade in Asia without someone like me and we couldn't trade in the US without people like them, so... Interesting. Interesting. Cool. Well, I appreciate everything you do for the industry. And like I said, I'll, br I'll bring this one to a close. 